Hello everyone, this is Melissa Lentz. I'm the Director of Education at OSEG, and I'd like to welcome you to our webcast today, during which we will present the second installment of our Policy Management Illustrated Webinar Series, entitled Standardizing Policy Design and Approval, Why It Matters. In most organizations today, it is possible to find policies floating around or even being enforced that have never gone through proper channels for issuance and approval. Some of these so-called policies have been written by people without the proper authority or without the full understanding of the impact that the policy will have on operations and risk management. Others are in conflict with each other or may be based on out-of-date information. Failure to have a consistent style and template for policies makes it even harder to know whether a policy is in fact approved and enforced. The need for policy development is continual, whether creating new policies or revising existing ones in response to change. Having a uniform approach to the style, content, and issuance of policies is a key step in gaining control and enabling effective ongoing management. In this webinar, we will present ways to establish a systematic and consistent approach to the creation and approval of policies. For our discussion today, we are joined by our speakers, Michael Rasmussen, GRC Research Analyst and Pundit with GRC 2020 and OSEG Fellow, Jay Lakoted, CEO of Clause Match, and our moderator, Carol Switzer, co-founder and president of OSEG. We are very pleased to have Michael, Jay, and Carol here with us today for the second installment of the Policy Management Illustrated Webinar Series, which addresses how to establish a systematic and consistent approach to the creation and approval of policies. But before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, regarding continuing education credit. We provide NASBA-approved CPE credit to you if you have an OSEG all-access pass, which you can purchase individually or as part of a company subscription. The all-access pass includes many benefits in addition to CPE credit for webcasts, such as access to all OSEG resources and on-demand education series. So if you don't already have a pass, I would encourage you to check it out on the OSEG site. If you do have an all-access pass and would like a certificate of completion for CPE for this event, please be sure to stay with us for the entire hour and to answer all the polls. These are requirements for receiving CPE credit for this event. Second, regarding the recording from this webcast. In a couple of days, we will have the recording of this event posted on the OSEG website. Just log into the site, then go to the Events tab and select this webcast. The recording may be viewed by anyone with an all-access pass. Third, regarding upcoming events and activities. Please watch your email for announcements from OSEG about other upcoming webinars. You can view information about these upcoming webcasts on the OSEG site. So today we will address the following learning objectives. We will understand the key roles of policy author, subject matter, expert and policy owner, identify appropriate approval steps and policy governance benefits, and review best practices for style guides and templates. But before we hand over the presentation to our speakers, we'd like to offer our first poll. And again, please be sure to answer this poll if you are interested in receiving CPE credit for this event. The first poll question is, do you have an OSEG All Access Pass, which is a paid membership, and would you like to receive CPE credit for this event? Um, so please go ahead and take a look at that poll question. And as you're answering this poll, I'd like to hand over the presentation to our speakers to begin our discussion today. Thanks, Melissa. I'm really pleased to have uh, both Michael and Jay with us here today to go over a dis deeper discussion into this portion of our series. As Melissa mentioned, uh, this is part two in an 11-part policy management series. In part one, we took kind of an overview of all of the steps in the life cycle, and now we're going to begin taking you into a deeper dive with regard to each of those steps, the first one being here, how do you develop policies and have a standardized approach to approval for them? As we go through the rest of our series over the next uh, several weeks, uh, we're going to look at all of the challenges and um, tips for how to address those challenges throughout the policy management life cycle. And we're also going to provide you with some sessions that will help you make the business case, prepare for change, and explain why policies really matter. <clears throat> this illustration and all of the others in the series um, are available uh, or will become available over the next few weeks. 
in the resource center on the OSEG site. <clears throat> if you go to the resource center and you select type illustration, you'll be able to find these as well as other illustrations in our GRC Illustrated series uh, over many years. So um, what I'd like to do next is, sorry, um, start with the question of, you know, who needs to be involved? Uh, clearly there are many players that engage in different aspects of policy management. In some organizations, that might be the compliance officer, but in others, there's a whole team of people that are involved. So, Michael, let's start by talking about that. Who needs to be involved? Who, who is most appropriate to involve in establishing a standardized methodology for policy authoring, issuance, and approval? And in what ways should they work together and collaborate? Um, well, I mean, really, anybody that has a vested interest in policies, and so the, the challenge is, is that a lot of organizations, as we've described in, some, in our previous webcast that we had, you know, have a, a, a fragmented, scattered approach to policies. Policies are in different templates and formats. They're, you know, uh, um, it, it, there might be 20 different policy portals in the organization. HR has got theirs, and Corporate compliance has theirs, and IT security's got theirs, and accounting's got their policy portal. Uh, and more and more, I'm seeing organizations take this enterprise approach to policy. Uh, and, and so in that context, you know, with an enterprise policy management strategy, uh, you, you need an approach and, and system that, has, that allows the different stakeholders from these different groups that, you know, have their own respective policies to be able to collaborate and work together. So as far as who needs to be involved, you know, it, it's going to range. It's going to depend on industry too. Uh, it's also going to depend on size and scale of the organization. You know, the, the a, a global bank that's authoring policies in 20 some different languages and has all these different uh, divisions and uh, and and uh, operates different jurisdictions is going to have a much more complex program than somebody that is just you know operating within one uh, domestic country under one jurisdiction uh, and publishing policies in one language. Uh, but, you know, you, you definitely need to get the different groups of, you know, HR and corporate compliance and ethics and legal and these different groups to work together uh, um, in an approach where they can all cohesively share and collaborate on policy management. Uh, now these different roles, you know, again, you know, one organization's approach is going to be different from another organization's approach. But, you know, at the center of it is going to be some type of steering committee. You know, or, you know, in, in some organizations that I've interacted with, they call it a policy governance council, or but I like the idea of a policy steering committee. And so this is going to be the committee where these different groups across HR and IT and accounting and corporate compliance and ethics and legal and uh, can all come together and define uh, and, and develop the overall policy management program, govern that program, uh, define what is an appropriate template for policies, um, you know, and be able to review policies and revise them, uh, the, the program as needed, uh, and, and it, it ha includes this cross-department representation. Then, then you've got the role of the policy program manager, you know, so the, this, the steering committee is the oversight committee that defines the overall program, and, and key to that is defining the meta policy, the policy and writing policies we'll talk about, uh, but from there, you have the policy program manager type role that manages uh, manages this on a day by day basis. And uh, the, the policy program manager doesn't author the policies themselves. In fact, uh, one uh, large global food retailer I've interacted with uh, on their policy management program, uh, their, their their policy program manager, who was named Barbara, you know, uh, she told me that the only policy she ever wrote was a policy on writing policies. But every policy went through her department for review and, uh, and to make sure that conform to the policy and writing policy, the meta policy, the style guide. Uh, she'd author it. I mean, she would not author the policies, but she would edit the policies to make sure they, they reflected the overall corporate tone and language style uh, that was needed. Uh, so the policy program manager is there to make sure policies are current, up to date, and written consistently to match the organization's structure and approach and culture. 
but then you have the role of a policy owner. You know, the, the, that's a, uh, the person that actually owns the policy. How I, how I define a policy owner is very simple, straightforward. Who owns the risk if this policy is going to be violated? So at, at the end of the day, whose budget, who, whose responsibility and accountability is it if there's an issue with this policy? That's the policy owner from my view of the world. You know, the policy owner ensures that each policy remains accurate and relevant uh, and, and takes ownership of that policy in their environment. Uh, now, the policy owner might author the policy, but most often that's delegated to a subject matter expert because the policy owner might not be the detailed subject matter expert on that area, um, like harassment or discrimination or insider trading or what market conduct, money laundering, whatever it might be. You know, the policy owner is going to delegate oftentimes uh, the writing of the policy to a policy author who's definitely the subject matter expert on that. Uh, and there could be a, a range of policy authors, too, because we might author our policy uh, in one language, say our master policy is in English, but then we have to uh, translate that policy into other languages, and then there might be different nuances and different uh, legal jurisdictions, regulatory jurisdictions that uh, might make a slight diversion from the core policy to meet the needs in one country or something like that. Uh, and so it, it gets quite intricate depending on the size and scale of the organization. But th those are some thoughts. That's interesting, Michael. It seems complicated, though. There are a lot of people that need to be engaged throughout this process. And Jay, maybe you could give us some examples of how using a policy management technology system that's you know, designed for this purpose can help those people to collaborate. Uh, yes, sure. <clears throat> Uh, I think um, uh, over the years working with many, many organizations um, and seeing how they do policy management today, uh, what we've seen is um, the technology uh, that is re required for this complex process um, needs to be today to have real-time uh, document collaboration at the core of the policy management platform. And that, that means that you don't have any more check-in, check-out the file and wait for the policy um, collaborator to um, put their comments in, put their changes in, and then check in the file back so the policy uh, owner or policy author can actually see what happened. So as you see on the slide, <clears throat> it needs to have um, uh, an access to document by several people with different roles uh, so um, they can collaborate and work on this document uh, at the same time. Um, and uh, record every time they do a comment, they make a change, or uh, they provide an approval to a particular paragraph, it gets recorded in real time. So if essentially you're working on a single version of a document. And uh, as you'll see in the next slide, here you've got two people currently collaborating and working on this policy, and each one is making their changes um, in the paragraph uh, or commenting on the paragraph where um, uh, you see the highlights. Um, and as you see on the next slide, uh, the full audit trail uh, from the, uh, these people is recorded against every single paragraph that gets changed. And that is important uh, because when you have uh, several people, and um, for example, at one global bank, we've been speaking to a credit officer who owns a credit policy. He has 150 people who need to uh, collaborate, approve, and provide comments um, on, a, on his policy document. And that every year he goes through a refresh or every time there is a change in circumstances or market conditions or regulation. So you can imagine his, uh, in his role collecting feedback from 150 people, it's pretty much impossible. So um, it takes six months to update that policy. So uh, as I mentioned, um, at the core of the technology which, uh, which addresses policy management, we believe in the future it should be uh, something that allows to collaborate in real time, keep the full audit trail, um, and record everything that happens um, on one single version of a document. So you don't lose a, a single piece of audit trail, and also you don't lose time by sending a file or a document to people and waiting for them to come back and trying to consolidate all of that feedback from them. So I see on the right in this paragraph activity section some questions like, can you take a look at this? How does that work? Is that like sending a 
an email or a Slack or some kind of notification directly to that person, or do they have to come back and and uh, look at at it to see that question? Uh, yes, exactly. So um, uh, whenever there is a question or a comment uh, or a change on a document, um, it either aggregates those changes in a period of time and then sends you an email notification outlining what you've missed, uh, or you can control that. So for example, for uh, specific comments which mention your name, it can send you uh, a notification immediately. If you're asked for an approval on a particular paragraph or a full document, it will send you a notification immediately via email. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. You know, one of the things I find very valuable about uh, having a system like this that keeps an, uh, an audit record is it's very helpful in a situation where personnel change you know, where somebody moves on to a different role or maybe even leaves the company, the information that's, that otherwise would just be in their head or in their personal files isn't lost. It's all maintained in, in one place, and that, that can be a really, I think, a really powerful and helpful um, structure to have. Um, I, I want to move on. Michael had uh, mentioned when he was talking about roles uh, having something uh, which we call the policy on policies, um, and that, you know, this is uh, the policy that helps to address the, the problem um, of, ha of potentially having inconsistent approaches to style and templates and approval process uh, overall for policies. Um, but I want to get into that a little bit deeper, Michael. Is it really important? Is it critical to have a policy on policies, or are there other ways to address this problem? Uh, and if you do have a policy on policies, what are its critical components? Well, Carol, to me, it's absolutely critical. I mean, policies are governance documents. So if, if we take the GRC definition that OSEC has uh, established that GRC is a capability to reliably achieve objectives while addressing uncertainty and act with integrity, uh, to uh, the, the address of the while well, the reliable achievement of objectives is the governance function, while addressing uncertainty is risk management and active integrity is the compliance piece. A lot of times we automatically think of policies of that compliance, uh, the acting with integrity, and that's critical and that's important. But policies are governance documents. They help us reliably achieve objectives. If we did not have policies, our manufacturing policies, our quality policies, our environmental policies, our health and safety policies, our accounting policies, our IT security policies, I can go on and on. You know, our business processes would be going all over the place. Policies allow us to have consistent business processes and outcomes. They're governance documents. Policies are also risk documents. The very fact that we have a policy means somebody's identified a risk, and that risk was significant enough that we had to codify in some type of written rules of behavior, you know, um, uh, what, what is acceptable and unacceptable uh, um, uh, behavior in, in a certain circumstance. And so we write a policy. Policies are risk documents. So if policies are governance, risk, and compliance type documents, you know, it's critical that we manage them as such and that we be able to uh, get control of them in the organization. But so many organizations I interact with don't even know what their official policies are. I was keynoting at one conference, and there's a couple hundred people in the room, and I asked the audience a question, who in this room has a master index of your, all your policies? That if the regulators or external auditors or opposing counsel in a lawsuit, whoever it might be, came in and said, what are the official policies of the organization, you know, and you can produce a list of what those policies are. Out of the 200 people in the room, two people raised their hand. Most organizations don't even know what policies they have. And I'm finding that organizations are cracking down and, and trying to build an enterprise approach to policies uh, to combat things like legal liability. Policies establish a duty of care. You know, I can think of one large uh, retailer. They have the issue that any store manager can open up a word processor and write a document and call it a policy. That puts a legal duty of care upon that, that retailer. If a, an employee or customer is harmed and somebody can go back and say, well, that manager said this, that there was this policy and that policy wasn't being followed, that can be used against that retailer. You know, policies establish a legal duty of care for the organization. And you can't have rogue policies and different levels of management and people authoring things and calling them policies in the organization. You need to be able to get control of that. So having a policy and policies is critical to be able to document and define what is a policy, what can be labeled a policy, how is it managed and approved in the organization to become an official policy of the organization, what's that central repository. 
that's what that policy on policies is, or what we call a meta policy. The meta policy itself defines roles and responsibilities and accountabilities. So do we have that policy steering committee I talked about? Uh, how often does that meet? How does that policy steering committee, uh, um, where does it report? Uh, who, who does it report to? It's most likely a cross-department collaborative theme. Is there some type of a, a senior executive or board-level reporting that it does? Um, you know, what, what, what's the, the role of keeping policies current in the environment? How do we even define what a policy is versus a procedure versus a standard versus a guideline? What's the structure and content? How are policies approved? The rules for creation, approval, retirement, updating and maintenance, and managing exceptions to policies. All of these are defined in that meta policy, the policy and writing policies, which I've got several examples of that I work on in my workshops too. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you say when you're at a conference and you ask people if they have something like this, very few people raise their hand. I, I want to um, ask our audience uh, the same question for our first second poll. Um, so. Uh, we want to know, does your organization have a policy on policies or something else that's a documented guidance and approval uh, requirement statement for developing policies? Um, and our choices are yes for the, for the entity in its entirety, yes, but only within specific departments, or perhaps each department has its own, no, but we're planning to do so, just no and no plans, or if you don't know the answer to that question, just say, I don't know. We just need you to answer the poll so you can get your CPE credit too. And while people are answering the poll, I want to move on to questions about defining policy development and approval steps. After you have that policy on policies, what are the key steps that you should establish for getting a policy designed and approved before it's implemented. Um, and then after we talk about those steps, again, I want to talk about how policy management technology can assist in this process. Michael, why don't you start? Certainly. Well, I mean, before you even author policies, it's important to have those foundational steps we just covered, that we have written and established our policy and writing policies, and in that context have determined what are the proper templates for a policy. Anybody should be able to pick up a document, whether it's a printed document or electronic document, and recognize that's an official policy of the organization just by the template it's in, because we have a standardized template that is well understood in what the, uh, when it comes to a policy in the organization. So we need to first off establish that policy and policies, the meta policies, and the associated templates and style guides and so forth with that as well. Uh, and, but then at some point, you know, we need to be able to determine that we need a, need a new policy. Uh, and, and there's a whole other webcast we've done that specifically goes into this, the determining a need for a policy. Because something in the environment's changed, a business change, a risk change, a regulatory legal change that indicates we need a new policy here where we didn't need one before, or we need to revise a policy. But then it moves into this overall process. Uh, and, and, and these steps three, four, and five are rather simplified. I've got a, uh, a one slide view of this that, you know, breaks out, you know, six to seven stages with, you know, about eight different steps in each stage on this. And then uh, for one uh, global investment bank I've worked with, you know, I've got a, a flow chart that flows across six different slides. Uh, so I mean, we're, we're simplifying it here. But we, we need to assign somebody to write that policy, that subject matter expert, the policy author who drafts uh, the policy, and, and more often what I'm seeing here is people want a collaborative approach. They're, they're tired of the document check-in and check-out. You know, we're, we're writing a policy is taking six months, and it shouldn't take six months. But, you know, Joe he just checked out the, the policy to do his piece of it, uh, and he, he's had it for the last two weeks, and he went on vacation. And now he hasn't checked back that, that document in, and, and so we have to wait two weeks so he gets back from vacation. There's a month gone by, and, and then Sally gets it. And she's got it for two weeks and to review and things and sits in her queue. That document check in and check out is, is slowing down policy management. And so what we're seeing a lot of organizations, particularly large global organizations I'm interacting with, that want a collaborative approach to, you know, uh, what I call collaborative accountability to be able to document policies and author them, you know, collaboratively in real time where I can be authoring my piece of the policy and, and somebody over in another part of the world like Singapore can be seeing those changes and making edits and themes just as I'm working on it. 
Um, and we can be assigned different tasks at different, you know, sections or clauses of the policy. You know, so we're collaborative and multiple people can be working in the same document at the same time and not and avoid all this document check-in and check-out that's slowing down policies. But we draft that policy and we review it in, uh, with subject matter experts and different departments for final approval. It goes before that policy steering committee or governance council, whatever you want to call it, for a final approvals, and at some point becomes the official policy of the organization. Jay, can you give us another view of what this looks like, this sort of collaborative process, by example of doing it within the technology system? Uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and I think, uh, so from what you're seeing on the screen is uh, just one example of um, a uh, workflow step, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, example of uh, workflow steps that can be set up uh, at a template level. Uh, but I think from policy management perspective, the system can really provide an enforcement mechanism for, for the entire process. So for example, where, when there is a template, the template <clears throat> dictates which steps a policy uh, needs to go through before it, 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 it can be published. So here, for example, you've got uh, drafting stage, stakeholder feedback stage, which is a mandatory stage. And then you've got committee approval, which is again a mandatory stage, and there is a, an, a mandatory approval by GRC committee. Um, and then you can also um, make the document not being able to be edited uh, in this stage, so the committee knows that this document um, is, is, is in its final form and it won't change um, during the approval process. But I think there is more as well in terms of <clears throat> enforcing uh, not just stages and approvals, but also um, uh, certain sections in the policy um, are inherited from the template and they cannot be changed. So every policy needs to have uh, a purpose, a scope, uh, heading, and the paragraph, and that can be enforced. And if the, those headings change and the template changes, it's enforced across the organization in every single policy which was drafted from that template. Um, and then as, as the uh, policy, um, uh, policy author goes through the document um, and makes changes, uh, they, they can assign uh, different paragraphs to different teams or different um, stakeholders for approval. So here, for example, there is a very, um, very important paragraph on, on uh, standard due diligence. And uh, in anti-money laundering policy or anti-money laundering standard, uh, this governs how we onboard clients. So, of course, it, it might have uh, 5, 10, sometimes even 15, 20 dozens of approvers uh, who need to approve this uh, paragraph. And uh, you can really dictate it as you are developing that policy. Uh, and all of these approval, approvals, they get recorded uh, in real time, but also for the audit trail in the future. So, for example, if there is an inves investigation three years down the line, and the regulator wants to know, well, why did you onboard this customer who's caught uh, uh, money laundering? Uh, you can go back um, and, and showcase that you have followed the policy which was approved at the time. Yeah, this raises a question, and we actually have a, a question submitted uh, on this topic uh, that I too am thinking about, which is, um, do you think that you have only one standard template for all types of policies? Or uh, could you have and could a system support having uh, maybe several different types of policies based on risk? So you have your high, um, your highest risk areas that have to be addressed have a certain template and a certain process and policies that maybe are less significant to the entity um, have a different template and a different process, or should everything be the same? Michael, do you want to tackle that first? Well, I often talk about that in the workshops that, you know, when it comes to like policy maintenance, we have a whole uh, webcast coming up just specifically on that topic of maintaining policies, measuring, measuring and maintaining policies. But I, I often reference like best practices is to keep every policy current every year. But, you know, a lot of organizations don't have the resources for that. So I recommend tiering those policies into high, medium, and low risk policies where high risk policies are 
uh, reviewed every year, medium risk policies every two years and low risk policies every three years. I was just answering a question yesterday from a large bank, you know, is there some type of model to determine what a high risk versus a low risk policy is? Uh, and to me, that's going to get back to your overall risk exposure. Every policy is a risk document. We would not have a policy if there was not a risk. So what are our highly significant risks? I think some things are obvious, you know, like our overall code of conduct uh, with the Me Too focus, definitely harassment, discrimination. Privacy is a high risk policy with GDPR and CCPA, market conduct, money laundering. You know, all those can be very high risk policies. Um, uh, but, you know, but then we might have medium and low risk. Now, should a, I think there's a different workflow template for high versus medium versus low risk policies. Uh, and, and so from a workflow standpoint, I don't think we need a, a visual different template for high risk policies versus low risk. I, I think that could actually potentially work against the organization because what if we're harmed by a low risk policy in some significant way and it, it, the, it's used against the organization that there's caught this, there we're neglecting this considering it was a low risk when it was maybe more significant. Um, I, I'm not sure if we actually visually communicate a policy that way, but, but there are different templates uh, from a workflow and accountability standpoint, for sure. That, that's my gut reaction to your question. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. That makes sense. And I assumed Jay, that uh, you could set up different categories like that, high risk, low risk, medium risk policies, and have different workflow structures set up for them. Yeah, and, uh, Carol, if, perhaps if I could add this, um, my, my vision is, um, is that the high, low, medium risk uh, is not going to be a, um, um, a set in stone um, type, of sta uh, type of standard. Um, my vision is that one day we'll have a dynamic risk profile of every policy and uh, being yeah. able to identify that, for example, a regulator is enforcing um, you know, a particular regulation in a particular risk area. So, for example, anti-money laundering, which is now very prevalent in, in financial services. Those uh, policies which are in the financial crime area, uh, they would immediately become high risk, and then you would know that they, they need to be following a certain template. Yeah, that makes sense. So when we start to look at what a typical policy template looks like and what areas of content should be included, um, I'm going to ask you, Michael, to kind of walk through that. And I'm going to pull up an image from our illustration, which obviously is not the design template for your um, policy, uh, more of an artistic view of what that template might look like. Um, but let's talk about that. What should the policy template contain, and why are each of these areas important? Okay, well, you know, there's some structural differences between a policy versus a procedure versus a guideline. Uh, so we can talk about different types of governance documents uh, from that perspective. Uh, but, but when it comes to the actual policy document itself, uh, you know, th there might be some different sectional areas, like different headings that differentiate an IT policy from an engineering policy, from an HR policy. But I argue that if it's an official policy of the organization, it should be in a standardized template, even though there might be some structural differences from one department to another department's policies uh, because of technical needs and things like that. Uh, uh, like an IT policy might refer to tech, uh, like logical and physical assets and things where an HR policy doesn't. Uh, and, and so in that context, there might be some different structural pieces to different types of policies but anybody should recognize it's an official policy just by the overall template it is in. You know, whether it's on the screen or in a printed format, you know, we could all be using Times New Roman 12 point font with one inch margins and the company logo in the upper left corner and some type of, uh, you know, indexing numbering system that catalogs and numbers that policy officially in the upper right. And, you know, it, my whole point is somebody should be able to recognize that's an official policy of the organization just by the templates it, it, it's in. Um, there are some standardized components to any policy, such as, you know, the policy title, the purpose and scope of the policy, the actual policy statement itself, um, any standardized definitions and uh, controls and, and cross-referencing and linking to regulations and policies and procedures and controls in the, in the documents and the overall history of uh, the different versions of the policy and what's been changed. 
you know, go through some of the standardized, you know, structural components of a policy, as you can see illustrated here. Um, but the main point is, is that, you know, anybody should be able to recognize that it's an official policy of the organization just by the template it's in, whether it's on the screen or printed. Okay, so in the illustration, we show a linkage between obligations that drive the policy and the related procedures and controls. We want in the template to, to have that statement about what are the obligations. And by obligations, we might mean a regulatory requirement or we might mean an internal um, statement of an obligation, this is the way the organization wants to do something. But, but why is it important to put that into the policy template to show that? Um, and how do we use our modern policy management technology to actually make that a, a meaningful connection rather than just stating maybe, you know, a citation of a regulation? It's Michael, about me. you want to start? Certainly, to me it's about mapping and contextual uh, awareness and understanding of the policy. Uh, you know, whether it's a regulation or a contract or a value of the organization, you know, we need to be able to map those to the policies. You take reg regulatory change, for example. Global financial services firms are dealing with 220 regulatory change events every business day. And, and obviously, we shouldn't be having 220 policy changes every business day. The organization's going to go nuts. But we have to determine which of those regulatory changes signify that a policy needs to be reviewed and determine if that policy is still appropriate for the organization. You know, we, we need to cross-reference and link, you know, regulations to policies uh, and, and policies to the related procedures. We might have a password policy uh, that says we'll use strong passwords on business critical systems, uh, but the way that pa password is configured in the SAP environment versus the Oracle environment versus the Windows environment, their step-by-step procedures change. Uh, and and, and uh, for each different types of technology. And so there's multiple procedures for that one password policy. Uh, and those are separate documents and we should cross-reference those. And that same password policy tells you length of password, complexity of password, frequency of change of password. Those are controls in the environment that can get automated and monitored. Your gift entertainment policy tells you the amount of a gift and the frequency that you can give a gift to any individual or entity over a period of time. Those are controls that get implemented in your environment. So policies have all these different cross-references and tagging, and we need to be able to tag them. And I'm finding a lot of organizations are wanting to be able to tag things, not at the document level, like this regulation to, the, to this uh, um, uh, policy. That could be chaos. I mean, look at the Dodd-Frank Act and the hundreds of pages Dodd-Frank Act is. You know, I'm seeing that organizations are wanting to map, you know, the clause of a, a regulation to a clause in a policy. And, and so when, when this section, you know, changes in a regulation, this section in this policy needs to be reviewed and, and be able to manage, you know, that, that cross-referencing and linking, not just at a document level, but at, but at that paragraph section or even clause level uh, in, in the policy to the regulation and things like that as well. So there's definitely a lot of uh, what we would call tagging, the mapping and linking of these policies to other policies and related procedures and controls, but also to the regulations and obligations of the organization. Yeah, uh, it all sounds really complicated to me, and I'm hopeful, Jay, that you can show us a little bit of how doing this within a policy management system can make it a little less complicated. Well, I think my, Michael got to the heart of the problem, is that um, in today's complex world, um, we we need to, to have the view of everything that uh, is impacting the organization, but uh, purely because by, by uh, the sheer amount of that um, uh, of the regulatory change uh, is almost impossible to keep track of, and then actually identify what is relevant to each uh, new regulatory document. And uh, regulatory documents, as Michael mentioned, uh, they can be extremely long. So. Dot Frank or Mifid II, for example, is uh, several million paragraphs. Imagine trying to uh, link that all together. So <clears throat> we need technology uh, which can actually help um, not just uh, to define those mappings, but actually maintain those mappings as well. So, for example, if you map a um, uh, if you map a paragraph in a regulation to certain uh, policies, 
standards, procedures, and actual paragraphs in those uh, in those documents, and then uh, the underlying controls in in the risk system. Then, if any part of that com of those components change uh, changes, um, we actually need to identify what else is impacted by that. So, what you see here on the screen is just a small subset of uh, what it could look like, and uh, you know where you, you have in one column your regulatory obligations, and when you're looking at one particular regulatory document, you can see all of your policy uh, policy documents, and then third column, you would see all of the controls mapped to that. So, um, And you can expand any one of them, and uh, you can see which exact paragraphs are mapped to each other. And um, uh, and, and, and it's not, not just the general overview, but um, uh, when you're looking at the document itself and when you're updating that document, uh, if you're working on, on a specific paragraph, it actually tells you um, and shows you which paragraphs in different uh, documents, like regulatory documents or controls, uh, it's mapped to. Uh, and if there is a change, it will actually track that change and alert you that there was a change um, in the uh, change column um, uh, of the of the of the that mapping. Uh, but also, um, if you click on it, you can actually see side by side what the actual obligation says in that regulatory document and what you are changing in your policy document and uh, how and whether your change in a policy document is actually still um, relevant and uh, uh, compliant to the regulatory requirement. Um, but I think also, um, because of the amount of, the, of data we have in the organization and uh, the data outside of the organization, uh, it's really impossible to map everything that, that is um, involved in this process. Um, so if you have um, uh, 50,000 regulatory changes affecting an organization every year and 30,000 controls and uh, several thousand policies, uh, which all contain millions and millions of paragraphs. Uh, for a human, uh, it, it's simply impossible to uh, to do that mapping. So, the the um, uh, technology actually actually needs to be smart. And uh, as you see on the next slide, uh, this is where technology works uh, to help compliance officers, policy owners, um, to find relevant content, whether it's a related procedure uh, down to a paragraph level or a regulatory requirement or or a control and then suggest you um, those mappings so you can easily go through them and confirm them. So when you say the technology is smart, does, does that mean th there's an element or you should look in any technology really for an element of AI or does the, poli the policy uh, director or steering committee create these um, prioritizations and put them into the system? Uh, so what I mean is, uh, uh, I guess, both. Um, and one is um, uh, the ability to have, uh, you know, the, the workflow and the functionality to make those mappings and then confirm them when, as they change, but also for the system to proactively, on the background, uh, evaluate any new content, any existing content, and whether it, uh, that content is related to each other and then suggest it, because otherwise you might miss that there is a new new policy uh, or a new procedure which was um, established in a particular entity in a, in a different jurisdiction, which is actually not following your global policy. I see. Okay, so I want to take a a second and uh, stop our conversation while we run our next poll. Um, and this question is, does your organization currently use a technology that is purpose-built for policy management? Uh, and by that we mean something other than spreadsheets or um, sharing type technology that's, that's general in nature. Uh, and you can say yes, Again, across the entire entity, yes, but only in some areas. No, we adapt other technology or we use spreadsheets. Or again, if you don't know, say you don't know, just make sure you answer the poll. Just pick whichever is most uh, appropriate for your response. And um, while we're doing that, I uh, 
want to, okay, having a little trouble with the slide control here. Um, I want to go into our next section and talk about developing history and version control. This is something that we note, uh, uh, that the authorizations and the version history should be included in the policy itself, on the policy template. So I want to know, Michael, what's the purpose of including these items in the policy itself? And then how do we, again, use technology to make this information uh, more usable? Okay, certainly. Well, for one thing, we want to know when was the policy last approved and reviewed uh, and who owns that policy? We, we need to be able to understand uh, at the end of the day who's accountable for that policy and owns it so we can map back there and when the last type of review and approval date of the policy was. You know, otherwise we have policies that live on indefinitely out there for years and years and years and haven't been updated or modified or even, you know, retired when the, they don't even maybe apply to the organization anymore and things are so out of date. Uh, we need an understanding of how that, that policy history has evolved over time, what's been added to it, uh, to not only, you know, document and show the organization how its risk posture has changed and how that history has evolved the policy over time, but to show the to the regulators that, uh, and uh, external auditors or um, law enforcement or opposing counsel in a lawsuit, you know what a policy looked like on a specific date and time, and uh, to show that the organization's uh, active in keeping policies current in a dynamic business, regulatory, and risk environment. Uh, now, when the external auditor or uh, regulator or opposing counsel in a lawsuit or law enforcement, whoever's knocking on your door, they're not always asking, what, what's your policy today? What's your harassment policy today? What's your money laundering or fraud policy today? They're, they're looking back at that issue you had two years ago. What was your policy on this date and time? Who was aware of that policy? Well, um, how was that policy kept current to meet your you know, risk and regulatory needs at that specific time in history? Uh, and and what, was the, what was that policy then? And how uh, was it understood in the environment? You need that history and audit trail to be able to defend the organization uh, that it is keeping policies current and relevant to the environment as that environment is constantly changing around you. And Jay, how does this work? Again, how does technology help make that easier than just having a long list of every revision on a on a documented piece of paper that is the policy template? Well, I think uh, you would be surprised how many companies um, have trouble finding even the current version of the policy um, as it stands mm -hmm. uh, when we, we onboard them. But um, of course, um, you know, the, the importance of keeping the audit trail of uh, all the changes and comments um, and um, different versions uh, I think Michael outlined that it's uh, it's the uh, defensibility which allows you to go back in time and pretty much understand what exactly happened on every single paragraph of that policy uh, where, as and when it becomes important um, in any given point in the future. So, uh, you know, from technology point of view, it's um, I think um, what we understood several years ago when we started building uh, our platform is that uh, Word documents and PDF documents are not very good um, storage formats of the audit trail uh, because two different versions of uh, a Word document, um, they don't store the full picture of what happened on this policy document. So in order to go back in time and understand how a policy, a particular version of a policy has been developed, you perhaps need to go through 20 or 30 different drafts or, you know, in the case of that credit officer in that large bank, 150 drafts uh, to actually understand uh, why the policy is in, in the current form. And potentially, you know, several hundred emails where the approvals are stored, where uh, justifications are stored. So uh, the ability of going back in time is actually extremely important. And that's why, you know, for several banks where, where now the, rec the storage of records of audit trail, which is uh, mandated by regulators in the US, for example. So I have a, a question I'd like to uh, pose to you, Michael, uh, from the audience. 
and that goes to the difference between policies and procedures. I think you touched on this a bit at the beginning, but the question is, how detailed should the policy be in describing the ways or the methods in which we will address a particular risk or objective that that the policy is meant to um, apply to? Isn't that really describing procedures? Uh, can you say that once more, Carol? Well, I'll summarize. The question really is, what's the difference between policies and written procedures, and should those procedures be part of the policy? No, the, we can separate that even further into policies, standards, and procedures, and even guidelines. You know, a, a policy is very much the why. You know, why is this important? The, the standard is, you know, the the, the what, um, and then the procedures, the how to, um, and then, you know, you have guidelines, which are permissive policies. Instead of you will do this, the uh, guideline says you should do this. It's more suggestive than required. Now, um, I get into a lot of debates and, and, and interactions with companies because if, what's the relationship? I mean, obviously guidelines are separate from policies because the guideline is like a policy that's permissive. Um, but, you know, what about standards and procedures? Um, some organizations want to completely separate policies from standards from procedures. Um, and I, I find that can be a little bit cumbersome in some organizations. If we have a, um, a, a, a strong password policy, the policy, the, the why, the strong password policy says we will use strong passwords on business critical systems. It, it only makes sense to me to include the standard with that. You know, a strong password looks like this. It's from five character sets, uh, 20 characters long and changed every uh, 24 hours. You know, th that's the standard. Uh, or the gift entertainment policy, you know, the standard there might be, you can give uh, a gift of up to $50 in value to any entity over a 12 month period. You know, th th that's the standard. Uh, and, and so um, standards and, and policies go hand in hand and they're often to me in the same document, but I do respect that some people separate them out. Now, a procedure is separate from a policy. It gives you the how-to. Procedures change every time a business process change. If we modify the accounts payable process, you know, uh, you know the, the policy itself for accounts payable may not have changed, but the procedure might change because of that process change. Or every time, you know, we have an upgrade in the software, you know, we have to change the password configuration policy on SAP or Windows. The password policy hasn't changed, but the procedure out of the how-to steps on how to configure that password has changed. So procedures are separate documents because uh, procedures are updated whenever a business process changes, whenever technology changes, and, and so forth. And so to me, procedures should be separate documents. There also, there could be many procedures for one policy. You know, we might have that strong password policy, but you, we might have 12 different procedures to how, on how to configure that strong password on 12 different IT systems applications, because a step-by-step -step sequence is different for each. And so procedures and policies are always separate in my mind, uh, but they're cross-referenced and linked to each other. Uh, standards and policies, you know, to me, those can be in the same document, although I do respect that some people separate them out. Okay. Um, Next, I just want to talk about you know, how you decide if you need a policy. You could have a great process for developing a policy, but what should you think about before you even decide to develop a new policy? And I'm going to ask you that question, Michael, but before I do, I, I want to make sure uh, I address this question we've gotten. Uh, a few people have said these you know, screenshots um, are great, but they're a little difficult to absorb. Uh, how can we get a, a more complete demo uh, from Jay of the system? And so I'm going to suggest that you just put into the question field a note that says, I'd like to get a demo of uh, the clause match system, and then we can uh, pass that information on to Jay. Okay, Michael, so let's go back to this. What are some of the questions you really should ask before you decide to even develop a new policy? Uh, to me, this is important because if we're writing a new policy, uh, anytime anybody, you know, comes to us and says we need a policy here, we're going to end up with, you know, 1,200 policies, 2,000 policies, you know, more. I mean, in fact, 
you know, because of mergers and acquisitions and everything, you know, one healthcare organization at uh, my policy workshop last week in New York said they actually have 21,000 policies. Um, uh, and, you know, and we, we need to have a manageable level of policies. Uh, and so I, I, let me step back. That was 21,000 policies and procedures, not just pure policies. But uh, um, we need some type of guidance of when do we need new policy? So when somebody comes to us, you know, we can hand them these series of questions or we can even make it like an online survey or something that can sort of route things into workflow and review as you determine a need for a policy. Uh, but some of the questions we should ask, is the policy required by law, regulation, contract, or other obligation? You know, it, in that context, you know, if there's a new law or change law or regulation that says we need a policy here, then it's pretty much black and white, we need a policy. You know, does the organization's size, business, industry, or workforce justify having that policy? Uh, will the policy enhance business performance, improve productivity, effectiveness, or efficiency? You know, policies are there to help us reliably achieve objectives. It, it, does it help the organization? Is it benefiting the organization to reliably achieve objectives? Will the policy enhance employer customer experience? Is the policy just create another layer of bureaucracy and oversight that isn't needed? Will the policy be consistent with the organizational culture? And to me, a key one, how do we handle this without a policy before? Yesterday, we didn't have a policy. Today, you're saying we need a policy. What's changed? Why do you need a policy today when we didn't need one yesterday? Uh, another key question is, can an existing policy be updated to address the, the items that, that you're, you're bringing to the table, eliminating the need to write a whole new policy? Can we just make a change to an existing policy that's in a related subject area and add something there instead of writing a whole new policy document? Um, and last couple few questions to consider is the time and money required to administer the policy reasonable in relation to the benefits and do we have the mechanisms to communicate and enforce the policy. Those are some questions to go through and I've seen people submit this just as like a, a sheet, you know, um, to people when they say we need a policy or even turn this like into a survey type tool uh, with workflow for reviewing themes to these questions to route themes to determine do we move forward with the policy or not. Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I I I'm curious, Jay, when you're using a policy management system, can you establish that kind of workflow for the, the decision making at the front end on whether we even need to develop a policy? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that you know the policy implementation or change request form could be used just simply to go through that and uh, you know get an approval to establish a new policy uh, but also um, you know without a policy a centralized policy management uh, tool uh, I think um, you know rather than having a policy simplification project it, it, it becomes a policy multiple multiplication project because um, uh, new policies are being established without actually going through these steps and uh, understanding whether this policy is required and perhaps we have a policy on this and uh, it can be changed to be adopted to the process. And uh, imagine if you can, you know, just a simple simple search across every single policy for a particular term and it will give you every single document which has that term. It, will, it would minimize policies over time um, that the organization creates. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. One of the big challenges uh, that we hear from people also, as Michael noted, you know, some organizations have uh, 10,000 or 20,000 policies when they really start to look around and collect them. And, and uh, one of the big challenges is even doing the initial review of those policies to see which ones might be inconsistent, out of date, or conflicting with each other just just to get started i i remember years ago uh one very large technology company that osec worked with put a halt to the development of new policies while they collected all of the existing ones and went through a multi-month process of of um, screening them uh, and cleaning them up if you will and anything that absolutely had to be created at that time you know, had to go through this policy management review group before uh, it could be released, but they were really encouraging people not to release new policies while they went through that initial process. One of the installments in this series that we're going to uh, address towards the end of the series um, gets deeper into that question of how do you prepare for making a change in the way that you manage your policies. 
um, what information do you have to gather, what analysis do you need to do around that gathered information, and so on. Um, and so I really would encourage everybody to take a look at the event page, make sure you've registered for all of the installments in this series. If, if you're not able to make a particular date, you might want to register anyway so that you get notified when the archive, the recording of that webinar is available. And the, if you missed the first installment, that is available um, now in our website under the Resources tab and then select Type. I think it's uh, Webinar Recordings or Webinar Archive, and, and you'll be able to find it there. Um, I want to thank you both, Michael and Jay, for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to everybody's questions. We will pass those questions along to Michael and Jay, so they may be able to uh, respond to you directly by email. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.